Martin Schulz is the SPD's lead candidate and Chancellor Angela Merkel's main challenger. Mr. Schulz, we're glad to be able to talk to you today here in Freiburg, southern Germany. Welcome, Mr. Schulz. Mr. Schulz, relations between Turkey and Germany are increasingly worsening. Which policies regarding Turkey could we expect to see if you were Chancellor? A policy that values Turkey as a close ally, a friendly nation, but which also takes into account the fact that almost half of the population is opposed to Erdogan, as we saw in the recent referendum. On the other hand, I would not allow Germany to continue to be provoked by Erdogan. You say you would like to break off EU accession talks. How does that fit in with what you've just said? It makes no sense to keep negotiating with a man who consistently goes against the fundamental principles that are required for EU membership. The European Union is based on law, on principles and on basic rights. Those rights include freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Turkey is systematically violating these rights, and that's why it cannot become an EU member. What do you mean by taking a clear stance? When you say you want to continue talks and also not abandon the Turks, who work to uphold democracy, what does a clear stance really mean? We support the opposition in Turkey. I have close contacts with the CHP Social Democrat Party. We have close ties to opposition elements in the arts, literature and science. If I were to meet Mr. Erdogan, I would tell him that I am deeply disappointed. Once he was considered a great reformer. Now he is politically isolating his country. How far can you go in criticizing him? But how much can we let him get away with? What if one of you were to go to Turkey tomorrow and file a news report? You could be arrested. That situation clearly does not reflect the principles of the EU. Would it then be the right approach to end accession talks? or make threats, saying, if you don't do this or that, then this or that will happen. Because up until now, the journalist Dennis Yuchel is still in jail, and other Germans are being arrested. Doesn't that mean diplomacy is then called for? We've tried all diplomatic channels. But let's take a look at how this might end. Mr. Yuchel, Ms. Tolu, and the German activist Mr. Steutner, whose case has now been taken up by Amnesty International, are still in jail. There are two possibilities. We don't manage to get them released, and Erdogan continues to negotiate with the EU about membership or we don't manage to get them released and we cancel the negotiations because of it. But at the end of the day, they might still remain in jail. Probably, but Mr. Erdogan will pay a hefty economic price for it. But on the other hand, you say the refugee agreement with Turkey should still stand. The refugee agreement benefits both sides. That makes a difference. The Turkish government is treating the refugees quite well. I visited some of the facilities on the Syrian border. The problem with Erdogan is not that he treats the refugees poorly, but rather his terrible treatment of the Turkish people. But it could happen that Erdogan decides to cancel the refugee agreement and say, if you say EU accession talks won't continue, then there will no longer be a refugee agreement. I don't believe that. Why not? Because he has a lot of refugees in his country. They want to stay there and they will. He can't just throw out 2.5 million people without isolating himself within the international community. But it already happened back in 2015 when lots of refugees came to Germany via Turkey. But they weren't deported from Turkey, they traveled through it. Exactly. What would happen if he again decided to open the borders and said anyone who wants to go to Germany or the EU is allowed to go? You've got to look at the series of events. The first refugees traveled through Turkey to the coast. Then smugglers took them to Greece. 
We asked Turkey to help put a stop to the people smuggling. I was part of the negotiations. And Turkey did put a stop to it. We're grateful for that. Turkey is dealing with the refugees that it has now, and I believe that Erdogan will continue to fulfill his humanitarian obligations. But if he doesn't, there's nothing we can do about it. Please, let me finish. This is important. I, for one, am not willing to remain silent about how Erdogan is destroying democracy in Turkey just because of the refugee issue. I have said, and I will say again, that due to the way the Turkish government is currently behaving, Turkey cannot become an EU member. If that leads to us cancelling the refugee agreement, then we will have to live with that and we will have to take care of the refugees. But I'm not prepared to get down on my knees in front of Erdogan. We cannot allow ourselves to be blackmailed. And I say once again, the way I know him, he won't be tempted to instrumentalize the refugees for his foreign policy. I think if he did that, he would lose all international credibility. Mr. Schulz, you say we have to deal with it. What would that mean exactly? Let us assume millions more really do come to Europe and Germany. What then? But we have to consider all scenarios. You say we need to deal with it. Does that mean you would favor limiting the number of refugees? No. Firstly, most of the refugees who reached Turkey stayed there. Only a small minority of them moved on. It was a high number, but it was only a fraction of the total. Two million refugees remained in Turkey. They won't all come to Europe at once. Many of them want to go back home, and we have a vested interest in seeing peace return to Syria. Limiting their numbers is not the solution. The European Union needs it's a cohesive refugee policy. That's the solution. The problem is not that we cannot accommodate the refugees. The problem is that a lot of EU member states refuse to take them in and say that Germany needs to deal with the issue itself. That's why I always say, were the 890,000 people who came to Germany in 2015 to be dispersed among the 508 million inhabitants of the bloc's 28 countries, there would be no problem. The refugees are not the problem. The problem is the lack of solidarity from the countries refusing to take them. Let me dig a little deeper here. What does that mean exactly when it comes to dealing with countries like Poland or Hungary that refuse to accept refugee quotas? As Chancellor, how would you handle Poland and Hungary? Hungary is questioning the EU in principle. The EU is a legal community and Hungary is not prepared to implement existing European law according to the supreme rulings of the European Court. That openly questions the EU as a community and that is why in return we must say that as of next year we will negotiate the next financial period of the EU. Germany pays in the most. The French president said a few weeks ago that the EU is not a supermarket where everyone can help themselves. That is why I believe that during the finance talks we will tell countries like Poland or Hungary, who receive large payments from the EU budget, that solidarity isn't like cherry-picking, but is a principle. Either we show solidarity in all issues or we forget the whole thing. What can Hungary expect from you as Chancellor if it doesn't stick to the refugee quota? that we will make some adjustments to the EU budget, that the countries taking in refugees get the financial support they need. But would you manage it by getting everyone on board? Right now, Germany stands alone on the refugee issue. Yes, it does, and that needs to change. Germany cannot remain isolated. This is a matter that Europe as a whole has to address. 
This attitude of, oh, we'll use our veto and then nothing will happen and the refugees will have to remain in Germany and won't come to us, that attitude is unacceptable. Some countries are saying Germany needs to sort out the problem itself, but also needs to pay into the EU budget so that we get our funding. That's the attitude in Warsaw for a start. As Chancellor, I would not put up with this. These are the people challenging the principle of the EU, not us. What happens then? We need to negotiate. What does that really mean? What would happen if it was your decision? It's very simple. The EU's financial perspective is a seven-year framework. Right now, that is 907... Let me finish my sentence. What's your question? Right now, the budgetary framework is 907 billion euros, and the biggest contributor is Germany. So we need to say, you're getting billions for infrastructure, economic development and agriculture, but you're not taking in a single refugee. So we need to agree on a fair distribution of refugees and fair financial support for taking them in. Poland and a few other countries are willing to go along with sanctions against Russia because they feel threatened by Russia. That's solidarity. When it's about long-term economic development, solidarity, no problem. Sanctions, sure. If it's billions, it's yes, please. But refugees, no thank you. The Chancellor must be able to say no. The principle of solidarity underpins funding, sanctions, but also the refugee issue. Or we need to re-evaluate everything. That's something these countries need to understand. They can't let others carry the EU's burdens while clamoring for the EU's benefits. Mr. Schulz, DW is an international broadcaster. Our viewers want to know what a Chancellor Schulz would stand for. For example, when it comes to migration partnerships. What do you mean? How do we deal with countries like Niger, Ethiopia, Senegal, Egypt, Libya? What deals or agreements would you make with these countries? I prefer the term agreement to deal. There are two issues here. We're seeing a massive wave of refugees leaving Africa and trying to reach Europe. Consequently, people smuggling has become an industry. We need to put a stop to it. For that, we need a migration law for Germany and Europe. Migration to Europe is not a crime. Applying for asylum should not be the only option for people who want to migrate to Europe. We need a migration law like the US, Canada, Australia, like the main immigration countries, so people can apply to immigrate. There's no guarantee it will be approved, but there needs to be an option. European countries need quotas, with individual countries saying how many immigrants they can take in. That's a completely pragmatic step we've been talking about for 22 years. I was a member of the European Parliament when we first started discussing it. We need a migration law and a process for people applying to immigrate via embassies and consulates. But you know when you refer to this exact issue that... Let me finish my thought. Okay, you want to gallop through highly complex issues in 27 minutes. We could do that. But then you'd have to accept that I can't give you the answers your viewers want to hear. You can't rush through these issues. We need a migration law. Alongside that, we have a guaranteed right to asylum law. Now, let me answer your question. In order to stop human traffickers, we must, if need be, work together with countries like Niger or others. 
that is only possible under the supervision of international organizations because constitutional norms must be adhered to and there is at least a risk of some nations not being able to follow international legal norms. Sorry. Sorry. First of all, you say there should be legal immigration to Germany and they should visit the embassy. You know how complex that is. If that were possible, not many migrants would come to Germany illegally. What do you mean exactly? Suddenly thousands would be outside the embassy in Libya, for example, wanting to come to Germany. Is what you are saying feasible? Is it feasible to abandon these thousands of refugees to people smugglers? Is it feasible to say, besides the fact that the new agreement is causing a lot of human rights violations, if we refer to Niger, for example, you already know what Doctors Without Borders or Amnesty International have said. They say human rights violations occur there every day. And they also say now is a dark time for the EU when it is making agreements with dictators. Have we reached the point that the EU has to work with dictators to relocate borders? No. But that's what's happening right now. As I told your colleague, if we work together with these countries, we have to do so under the aegis of international organizations, the UN, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or EU bodies. So that normal constitutional principles are upheld which these countries either can't uphold or don't want to uphold. But we don't have migration law. That's a big deficit. So the alternative is what we're seeing happen right now. We're not working together with these countries. They're not interested in working with us. And those that profit are the traffickers who round up these people, stick them in boats, take all their worldly possessions, lead them out to sea, and send thousands of them to their deaths. The smugglers need to be tackled. And doing so might mean working together with these countries. But using structures that we control, not them. But that's not a long-term solution. So to return to my point, we need to establish a migration law for Europe. I'd like to address another issue. Mr. Schulz, the world is following Germany with greater intensity than we've seen in a while, especially in the run-up to the election. Our viewers keep saying how astonished they are that a right-wing populist and nationalist party like the AFD can become so popular in a country where so many people are so well off. My question is, how do you explain why so many Germans are so angry at Germany? so viele deutsche Bürgerinnen und Bürger auf Deutschland haben. Wenn ich da auf eine in sich geschlossene Antwort I wish I had a simple answer for that. Glücklich. Ich glaube, dass man You have to look at this situation on several levels. Da gibt's eine ganz ein ganzes Setting. There are a number of reasons for these developments. The Federal Republic of Germany is a perfectly normal European country, and our society is no different from any other. We've seen these phenomena in other countries. Take the G7 states, for example, including the UK, France, Italy, and Germany. They also have citizens who are frustrated, and those people have joined political movements. We live in a globalized world where everything has been turned on its head. Due to digitization, we are experiencing major changes that frighten many people, and at the same time, we are experiencing how politicians lack the courage to tell the people that things won't be the same tomorrow as they are today, and today isn't the same as yesterday. We're experiencing rapid changes, and that is why we must proceed with courage. That courage also means telling the people exactly that, and that is what I'm accusing Angela Merkel of. 
Angela Merkel manages Germany's status quo according to the motto, a country in which we live well and enjoy living in. She is right. We do live well and enjoy living in this country. But we also want life to be good tomorrow. And that is why we need to tell the people which course we are taking and where politics are headed. This implies that everything's fine. The government has everything under control. And when people find out that this is not the case, a lot of them get upset, particularly those in the middle class. Look at the people in Britain who voted for Brexit, or the Lega Nord and the Grillo movement in Italy, or the Front National in France. This anger is, in principle, nothing more than a rejection of the fact that the world is going through dramatic changes. What would you do differently to Angela Merkel? I'll give you a practical example. We've talked a lot about the refugee crisis. By taking in the refugees, Germany is fulfilling a huge humanitarian commitment. And we should be proud of that. I personally would have gone on TV and told people why we were doing this and how we're going to do it. And I'd have asked them to help. But Mrs. Merkel said only, we can do this. It was left to other people and they weren't given the means to do the job. When you're the leader of a country, you have certain obligations, and one of those is to tell the people what's going on. But sometimes that means telling them things they won't want to hear. What would a Chancellor, Martin Schulz, have said about the refugee crisis? I would say, this is just the start of something that we will be dealing with for the next 10 to 15 years. This is an epochal challenge. Migration will continue. Germany is the EU's largest country, so we must lead the way. All Europeans must take part, not just us and Italy and Greece and Cyprus. That will help us to fulfill our humanitarian obligations without placing the burden on just a few countries. If we demonstrate solidarity, we can make this work. But it hasn't happened so far. It will take some time, but I promise you I will work hard on this. That's what I would have told the German people. Would you also tell the Germans that they might have to give things up? That maybe in five or ten years Germany won't have it so good anymore? No, I wouldn't say that because it's not the case. A lot of the refugees have valuable job skills. The right-wingers quote me as saying, what these people bring is more valuable than gold. But they leave off the part where I say, they have faith in Europe and its values. You can see it in their eyes. Many of us Europeans have lost that faith. I've also said, we have always, as Europeans and as Germans in particular, been especially successful when we were open, tolerant and courageous. We have always failed to succeed when we shut ourselves in and tried to suppress others with our power and wealth. That has always ended in disaster for Germany. That would have been a courageous thing to say because not everyone would agree with it. But it would be better than saying, we're wealthy and there are so many opportunities here, let's make the best of this. It'll be good for us and good for them. In an interview with Spiegel magazine, you said, I must try to be honest. You'll have noticed in the course of the conversation, I'm always honest. If you want to take an honest look at the past months, when you were voted party leader, the polls put you in a strong position, but now things look very different. When you are putting on a brave face, how do you really feel? Fine. Really? Sure. 
Klar. Aber äh, wenn man jetzt menschlich redet, jeder... From a personal der, point of view, doesn't it hurt when the polls show you to be right at the top and then you keep on falling deeper and deeper? Senkt dann laut Umfragen, das tut doch allem weh. No, sorry, I'll have to disappoint you there. When I open the morning paper and the polls are favorable, I am happy. If I open the paper and the polls are bad, I'm not happy. But throughout my life, I have had my share of ups and downs. My inner equilibrium tells me polls are just polls. The people will speak on September the 24th. And then we'll see. Do you know what happens if you allow yourself to be guided by opinion polls? You abandon your principles and give in to popular opinion. I don't do that. We have one final question for you. Just imagine you had to spend one month on a desert island and could only survive by taking one of the other leading candidates with you. You have no choice. You have to take one of them or you won't survive. I can't see them all. I have to take one of them with me? You have to decide. Özdemir. I know him best of all. We were colleagues at the European Parliament. I also know Ms. Wagenknecht. She was also there with me. Cem Özdemir is a fine man, a really decent guy. Mr. Schulz, we always finish with a selfie. Would you mind?